In the previous episode in our series on building scalable applications in the cloud, I demonstrated how to set up a distributed cache. In this episode, I'll talk about how to set up the database tier. As with any web-based application, this tier can be very challenging and can be difficult and complicated to architect correctly. Now, as I've done at the beginning of each video in this series, I will start by reintroducing the reference architecture shown here that has been the focus of our discussions thus far. In previous videos, we have done a deeper dive into each of the load balancing, application, and caching tiers. In this video, we will discuss the details surrounding the database tier and describe techniques for scaling this vital component of your application. Now, I'd like to make a few general comments about the database tier before we delve into the details. As you will see shortly, and may already be aware, numerous architectural options for database implementations exist. As no two applications are the same, there is no one-size-fits-all solution when it comes to these architectural options. As such, it is always recommended that you perform functional and load testing to assist you in determining the ideal configuration for your particular application. Now the tried and true right scale database configuration, and the one you get out of the box with our server templates, is the master-slave configuration, or in particular a MySQL master and slave. Now while many of our customers run a single master and a single slave, we always recommend you run multiple slaves if the budget permits. Additionally, we recommend that you distribute the master and the slave or slaves across availability zones. These two points again help to increase the availability and reliability of your overall application. We also recommend that you always use the same instance size for both your master and your slave. Now you may be tempted to use a smaller instance size and save money on your slave if it's just doing replication because it may be vastly overpowered for that purpose. But you generally chose the master database instance size for a particular reason. It was powerful enough to handle the load that it was going to see. And if that master was to fail and you're going to need to promote a slave to a master, you'd end up promoting this underpowered slave to the new master and you would then have to scramble to bring up a new slave of that larger size and promote it to master. All the while, your database and your application as a whole is suffering performance degradation. In terms of data storage, we recommend if you're using AWS, use EBS volumes for your data store. And regardless of the cloud you're using, we recommend that you never use the ephemeral or local or transient storage for your persistent data. If that instance was to go down for whatever reason, you'd lose that data as well. We recommend you back up the master and slaves frequently. And the RightScale server templates back up the master every four hours and every slave every hour, although those are configurable in, uh, intervals via some uh, server template inputs. We also recommend you upload these snapshots to S3 or whatever your cloud of choices version of persistent redundant storage is. And that's to allow you the ability to do both the backups and recoveries of your database. What instance size should you use? Well, this varies greatly based on the nature of your application. And as such, we always recommend you run load and functional testing to help find those benchmarks and to help you assist you in figuring out what is the ideal instance size for your database. And again, we always recommend you over provision here to give yourself some room to grow so that if things go really well, really quickly, you're not scrambling to get that additional infrastructure in place. Some rate scale customers have expressed an interest in AWS's Relational Database Service, or RDS. Now, it's important to note that this is an AWS-only solution and therefore is not cloud portable. And similar to the ELB, or Elastic Load Balancer, that we discussed in the Load Balancing Tier video, it's an appliance, in this case, a database appliance. And as such, you don't have access to the instance. You can't log in or SSH into this database instance and run top on the box, for example, or look at your slow qu query logs, things along those lines. And for some of our customers, that's fine. They just want an appliance they can throw out there in the cloud and use it as a database. Whereas other customers really want to have that access and that configuration capability so that they can go in and tweak and fine tune their database. And in those environments, the RDS solution would not be a viable one. Now RDS does require scheduled downtime, up to four hours of maintenance per week. Now while this used to be a problem for production environments, we couldn't really recommend a solution that had to be down up to four hours a week. Amazon added, uh, added the concept of multi-AZ or multi-availability zone functionality, which essentially gives you a primary and a secondary. And you can set those maintenance windows differently on those two primary and secondary instances. And that allows you a 24 by 7 operation in that when the primary needs to have its maintenance performed, AWS will automatically fail over to the secondary and vice versa when the secondary needs its maintenance window. Additionally, read replicas have been introduced, and this really provides the concept of read-slave functionality so that your application can take advantage of uh, reading from multiple instances and avoiding a load on one particular RDS instance. 
I now like to talk a little bit about database scaling, and in particular we're going to talk about two types of scaling. First one will be vertical scaling, and that's a concept of growing or shrinking a database server from one instance size to another. For example, if you're using AWS's M1 large for your database, and over time you realize that it's not cutting it anymore, you need a, a larger instance size with more memory and more power, well, you can vertically grow that instance from that M1 large to an M1 extra large, or an M2 double XL or quad XL, or whatever the case may be. And the RightScale platform allows you to do this in an automated fashion with virtually no downtime. Now the other direction is horizontal, and that's the concept of adding additional servers to help spread the database load. And these next few slides will help to pictorially represent the vertical and horizontal scaling concepts. So we start out with a situation such as this, where in the lower left portion you see a small type A and a small type B server. And in the vertical scaling concept, we end out with the same number of servers. We still have an A server and a B server. They're just on a larger instance size. Conversely, you can scale in the horizontal direction. And that's where you end out with servers of the same size. They're both still smalls, if you will. But you have more of them to help handle that database load. Now, I'd like to go into a bit more detail around horizontal database scaling. And probably first and foremost, the most straightforward form of horizontal database scaling is the addition of read slaves. And as the term implies, this is where additional slave databases are added to handle the read load of the application. And it's obviously effective for read intensive applications in that only the writes need to access the master, and all of the reads can be distributed to the read slaves within the pool. Now replication lag may be an issue and should be considered. If you have an application that may write to the database and then quickly read that same data object from the database, then the replication of these slave servers may not have occurred yet, and therefore they may return stale or outdated data. So that needs to be considered in your application design. Now an effective mechanism to implement something like this is to use something like MySQL proxy, which is pictorially represented here. And here's where we have your scalable app array, your app server 1 through n. And instead of talking directly to the database, they talk to the MySQL proxy server. And the MySQL proxy server is smart enough to know where the master database is and where all the slaves are. And if a request for a write comes in, the MySQL proxy will send it directly to the master. But if a read request comes in, it will distribute it to one of the read slaves, typically in a round-robin fashion, although other algorithms are useful as well. Now this, what is pictorially represented here, is not necessarily the best practice implementation, and that the MySQL proxy server here shows as a single point of failure. And what we generally recommend instead is that on each of the app servers, a local MySQL proxy client is co-resident with the app server, and therefore the app server talks to the local MySQL proxy client, and that MySQL proxy client knows where the master and all of the slaves are as well. And therefore, if an app server goes down or is taken out of the app scalable array, all the other app servers can still access both the master and all the slaves. Now, another effective way to accomplish horizontal database scaling is to use sharding. And the concept here is that you partition your database into distinct non-overlapping pieces. It's essentially a horizontal slicing of your database tables into groups of rows. Now while great benefit can be gained by using a sharding solution, forethought is required in setting up those shards, since any cross shard joins, that is a query that involves multiple instances, is going to be slow and resource intensive. Now what you see here is sort of a before sharding and we'll see an after sharding in just a moment. Where here you have an app server, and this could be an app server array as well, that's ac accessing a particular master database and we're assuming that the records here are usernames sorted by last name. So after sharding, you end out with a concept such as this. The same app server is now accessing four different instances that implement one logical master database. And you'll see that each of these databases has a distinct non-overlapping portion of the original database on it. Now similar to the MySQL proxy concept that we discussed previously, the app server needs here to be smart enough to know where each of these shards are, or it has to have some sort of proxy in between that has that intelligence layer built in. No discussion of horizontal database scaling would be complete without at least a mention of a master master. And as the name implies, this is where you have two or more master databases. And what's different between this scenario and one where you have multiple read slaves is that any master can modify any database object. Now replication lag can be a real problem here and can lead to database inconsistencies. If you have a poorly designed application where multiple application servers may be doing rapid reads and writes to the database, you can end out with data object collisions and it leaves your databases in an indeterminate state. You can get to a situation where one of your master databases is correct and the other is not, but you don't know which is which. And as such, it's not a recommended best practice, nor is it supported by RightScale. But some of our customers have had limited success with this in very specific use cases, and we mention it here for completeness. The last concept we're going to discuss with regards to horizontal database scaling are NoSQL solutions. 
And there are many options out there. For example, AWS is SimpleDB, things like Cassandra, Membase, and some of the others you see listed here. Now these are all basically key value stores in that no complex operations between data objects can be performed. And while they are indeed no SQL solutions, you can also think of them as no relational solutions and that no relational operations can be performed amongst your data objects. Now if your particular application lends itself to this environment, these NoSQL solutions can be very viable options. They typically implement a distributed data store by using multiple nodes, and as such, having a coordinated backup across those multiple nodes can be very challenging, and generally the NoSQL solutions are not a good fit for where you need a coordinated backup and recovery solution. Now some Rightscale customers are beginning to use some of these NoSQL solutions in very specific use cases and getting great benefit from them. This concludes my demonstration on how to set up a multi-tiered architecture for scalable web applications. In the final episode, we'll summarize the best practices we discussed and talk about next steps for creating scalable applications in the cloud.